Very often when I work out, I like to, well not very often, always when I work out, I like to watch videos because it makes the time go faster. Otherwise, it's very boring sitting there on that elliptical waiting for the time to go faster so I can be done. So anyway, I'm watching these movies and I have to look for things that might be somewhat interesting. And I came across this movie on Amazon uh, called Absolutely Anything. I read the premise of the story and it looked very interesting. So I says, you know what, I'm going to watch this show. So I did. And I found the premise fascinating. Very cool stuff. I really was all into it and the movie started out really good and it was, uh, I thought, wow, this is going to be a great movie and it turned into kind of slapstick and juvenile and just predictable unfortunately and it ended up including elements from a lot of other movies so it, what started out as a great premise ended up being a mediocre, okay kind of a movie. Anyway, I'm not here to critique the movie. However, because the premise was so good there were a lot of very interesting clips in it that uh, I can't pass these up. These clips are so good because it helps to demonstrate some really interesting points um, and really great visuals here. So I'm going to be using these clips, four clips basically, to discuss some interesting points. All right. Uh, so just to get us into it, I'm going to start off on this first clip to give you the premise of the movie. So here we go. The mission to find intelligent life similar to ours out there in deep space. The probe carried a tablet which had inscribed on it the image of us humans, a man and a woman, and a map to locate us in the universe. Stage four disconnects, and our probe is fired on its long journey. The world wished it bon voyage. To Uga Baka Porti. Hello, no foolish Thoria Borsmaker Basco. Communication will be carried on in the language of the species to be judged. Bravo, maintenant nous sommes ici. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. Excusez-moi, je me trompe. Ah, is that better, Cardi? Understanding you now, Sharon. By the power invested in me by the Intergalactic Council of Superior Species, I hereby pronounce a destruction order on the planet Earth. With great respect, Sharon, we should not pronounce a destruction order before we've given these Earthlings a, a chance to prove themselves. God, they've penetrated intergalactic space! Morian is right. They're clearly not a superior species! Ugh. If these... Earthlings can convince us that they are superior beings, then they may join our society. If they cannot, we must eliminate them for the moral well-being of the entire intergalactic community. Thank you for explaining it to me, Sharon. Not at all, Miss Barker. 
the premise is this. Humanity has developed this probe that will leave not only the solar system, but the Milky Way galaxy. And as this probe extends out into intergalactic space, these other beings out there have a club going on. And they call themselves, or the leaders of this intergalactic club, call themselves the Intergalactic Council of Superior Beings or superior species, I forgot which, but you get the idea. And they have decided that they, they, they get to choose who is going to be permitted admission into this intergalactic council of superior beings and who is not. Now, the stakes are pretty high here because if you're admitted, you get to join this club and there are perks that go with that, supposedly. And if you're not admitted, if you're deemed mm, unacceptable, in some way, morally reprehensible or whatever, then your entire planet is destroyed. Everybody gets killed, all right? In the next clip, we see how they make that determination. The usual test, Sharon? The usual test, Skyrim. One Earthling will be chosen randomly as defined by the Intergalactic Manual of Good and Evil. Page 56, paragraph B. Uh, page 56, paragraph D. Um. Right. To prove that they understand the difference between good and evil. How will they prove it? They will be given the power that all superior beings have. The Earthling will be capable of doing absolutely anything. What if he uses his power for evil? The Earth will be eliminated. But if he uses it for good? Then we welcome them to the intergalactic community. Are we ready, gentlemen? Commencing random selection of Earthlings. Processing. Processing. Earthling. Jolly good. Wait. Selected. Oh. The Earthling has ten days to prove he can use absolute power for good rather than for evil. Dennis regurgitate my notes from chapter three. If you could make something impossible happen. Intact. What if you could make someone worship the ground you walked on? Come on, Ray. That would be taking an unfair advantage of an innocent girl. Okay, but suppose there was one thing you could do that would change your life for the better. Oh, that's easy. I would make alien spaceships destroy 10C. Oh, sounded like it was in the school. Out of the way! Out of the way! Stand back! Stand back! Stand back! Stand back! Okay, just stay calm. It was the salubrious gat of galaxy G946 WOT. Gat, what do you think you're doing? Just practicing, Sharon. We haven't done the judicial review yet. We may not want to destroy this species. Who are you kidding? 445,349,722 new alien species encountered. Number granted membership of the intergalactic community of superior beings. Zero. We have high standards. You know you're gonna wipe them out. It all depends on the Earthling. Okay, so there's your story. The Earthling, the entire Earth is going to be judged on the basis of the behaviors of one person chosen at random. And if they use their infinite powers to do anything they want, if they use those powers to do good, then the entire species will be deemed worthy, and if they use that absolute power for evil, they will be deemed morally unworthy, and everybody on Earth will be killed.
So what I want to do is compare in contrast this alien deal to the deal, if you will, that God gives humanity in the Bible. Because there are some interesting uh, comparisons. There are some things that it has in common, and I guess that's what got my attention, is the amount that it has in common with uh, the spiritual deal versus this cosmic deal. Uh, for one thing, in this cosmic deal, you have one or the other. It's a binary choice. Either humanity will pass and be deemed as morally good, and they get to live and join this intergalactic council, voila, or they will be deemed as morally bad and they will be destroyed. Now, compare that to the spiritual deal. Well, it's not just spiritual. It's kind of forever thing here. So the, the, the deal that God is offering in the Bible. In the Bible, God is basically presenting to man a choice, either it, it, either it's faith, it's either trust God, uh, enter into a relationship with him, uh, or if you choose against that, the other door is kind of the destruction one. You go to a, you're not eliminated, but you go to a place where you wish you could be eliminated and it never ends. So it's a binary thing. If you succeed, Wow, great things are in store, wonderful things. If you fail, very, very bad things. So those are some of the similarities. Now, the differences. In this particular case, everybody's fate is chosen on the, base, on the basis of the decisions of one person chosen at random. Now, if God were offering that deal, and everybody was aware that God was offering that deal, we'd be pretty mad about that. I don't think people would accept that. They would, they would, they would boycott. Well, we can't really boycott. What can they do? Nothing. Okay, But people would not be happy about it. All right. I mean, that would be one of those things where God would be seen as the enemy for giving us such a lousy deal. Choosing one person at random, uh, would you like to be judged on the basis of one individual that's not you? Probably not. So the God deal is, you know, has many more points in favor of it in terms of fairness. All right. Now, what does God do? He leaves it from the biblical perspective. The decision is one-on-one. -on -one. Every individual uh, has that choice. Uh, and you're not given absolute power to see what you're going to do with it. You're given limited power, and that limited power is called, what is your limited power? It's called free will. That's your limited power. So within the laws of physics, you are allowed to do absolutely anything as long as it doesn't violate the physical laws. And pretty much you can use your free will however you want. And based on those decisions, whether you choose, um, for example, just to give you, a, we talked about this in some of my other programs, so I don't want to bring it all up again. But as we go through life, we come to crossroads many, very often. And at those crossroads, we have to decide, do I do the right thing or do I do the easy thing? Do I do the thing that makes me feel good about myself or do I suck? accept responsibility, and try to grow and move on and do the bigger thing. Do I do right or wrong? Do I pursue a relationship with God or do I ignore that? Do I pursue love relationships with other people? And I'm not talking about Hollywood-style love. I'm talking about self-sacrifice, um, compassion, concern. Do I make sacrifices and do good for others because it's the right thing to do and not because they've earned it in my eyes and because I'm getting something out of them, okay? Those are the choices choices that we face on earth. Do we choose good or bad? Do we choose faith or fear? Um, there are all kinds of things like that, but it's your choice. It's our individual choices. We're judged individually and not based on some random person or even corporately as a planet, but as individuals. So I think that's a lot better deal. Most people would admit that the God deal is a lot more fair than what the Intergalactic Council is offering here. Now, very often, God gets criticized because bad things happen on earth. What we do with our free will, God gets blamed for that all the time. You look at all of the murder and maiming and rape and, and, and theft and just so many unjust, horrible things happen. Things, bad things happen to innocent people, to young people, you know, and God, in his infinite power, could control that. If he, if he was all-powerful, then why doesn't he stop people from doing bad things? Because people do bad things with their free will, and those bad things affect other people who didn't necessarily do anything to deserve it. 
So if God is all-powerful, why does he not use his all-powerfulness and limit people's free will? Why doesn't he give, why, why doesn't he, and at the same time, they get mad at God because they don't have more power. They wish they could just pray and make God do whatever they wanted. Again, you know, a lot more people would have faith, a lot more people would be Christians if the deal was, say some magic words and I'll give you whatever you want. So on the one hand, they're mad at him for not giving them more power, and they're also mad at him for giving other people too much power. So which is it? And that's something that, if you're mature, you understand the problem here, okay? He can't, if he's going to give people uh, superpowers and the power to do pretty much absolutely anything, then you got to be ready for the bad that comes out of that. Because what kind of power is it if you give people power to do anything and then you control what they want? If you're going to give people free will, then free will means I am free to choose what God likes and what God doesn't like. That's what free will is, okay? And if I am blocked from using my free will because God doesn't like it, then I don't have free will. So when we ask God, hey, you know, we don't want to live in a world where no bad things happen, what we're asking ultimately is for free will to be extracted from humanity. That's what we're actually saying, okay? So again, to recap, in the galactic deal that's being offered, one person is given absolute power, and then they decide based on what he does with that absolute power whether to admit them into the intergalactic council of superior beings or to destroy humanity. Whereas what God is doing is saying, you know what, I'm not giving you absolute power, I'm giving you power and free will, and we'll see what you do with it and make the decision on what to do with you based on your choices. Please, you decide which one do you think is more fair according to your ethical code. And would you want your enemies to have absolute power? How many people do you know that you would like to see with absolute power to do anything? And looking at your own history, you know, would you like to see you at 16 with absolute power to do anything? No, in the next clip, there's another cool point that's made in the movie, and I don't think they intended these to be deep philosophical points, but they made them nonetheless, and I have to talk about them. This is a situation here where Robin Williams plays the role of the guy's dog, and in the movie, with his absolute power, he gives his dog the ability to speak. So just watch the clip, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Dennis, what are you talking about? That's a good idea, actually. What are you talking about? Dennis, be able to talk. Biscuits. <laughs> what? Biscuits! Maybe if I make her fall in love with me, like, a little bit, you know, so she doesn't want to marry me, but she would Biscuits. have sex on a regular... For crying out loud, they're in the cupboard! What are... Biscuits! Red biscuits, black biscuits, nothing else matters! Is that all you think about? Yes! Yes! Biscuits! <laughs> All right, Dennis, become a rational thinking creature. Hmm. Look, I just can't concentrate on anything until I've had one of those biscuits. I know it's crazy, but that's how it is. I guess I'm kind of hooked on them. So please, give me just one biscuit, then I'll be able to think about something else. Hmm. That makes sense. Oh, 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 he's getting the biscuits! He's getting me off! This is it! Yeah! Woof. He's got them! Woof. He's got them! He's gonna throw one. Get ready, get ready. Here it comes! God, it must be terrible being a dog. I never realized you had so many cravings. I thought I turned you into a rational thinking creature. Rational thinking creatures still have desires. Oh, well, we can soon deal with that. Oh, no! Oh, no, no, don't take my desires away from me. Why not? They're what makes my life worth living. Biscuits shagging. I don't think I like your conversation. But I worship you, Master. I love you so much. I can't bear displeasing I, you. I know, My whole world collapses when you're cross with me. Look, maybe it was better when you didn't talk. Oh, no. Don't take away my power of speech now that I can think rationally. That would be so cruel. All right. Um, it's, I think it's a pretty funny interchange because I, I, I came to the conclusion myself from owning many animals over the years that if animals could talk, it wouldn't change anything because you get to know your pet. And after a while, you figure out that pretty much that is all they think about. I mean, if they could speak, like I don't need my cat to speak. I know what he wants. It's, he thinks about food 24-7. When he's awake, you know, I have to keep him out of my bedroom because he was waking me up at 4 and 5 in the morning 
because he figured when I got up, it's breakfast no matter what time of the night it was. Okay, so I had to lock my bedroom so he stops doing that. He thinks about food all the time. So if he could talk, he would just be talking about food. It would drive me nuts. So I that, that thought this was great because uh, they make that point in, in the show. Now, there's one particular comment, though, when, uh, when our protagonist gets ready to take away his dog's desires. And the dog's response was, hey, don't take away my desires. Don't take away my urges. That's what I live for. That's what makes life worth living. All right. Now, wh the reason that struck a chord is because, okay, yeah, it applies to animals. There's nothing wrong with a dog who says that because that's what dogs do. That's what they are. Humans are not dogs. We're, we're, we're different than other organisms on the planet. We're different than all other animals. We're different than all other primates in many, many respects. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, and something that I, that I say a lot, uh, and I, I probably at least once a week I give a patient this particular uh, talk, is that is your consciousness is divided into four sub-entities. Uh, if you take a look at the brain, you have at its base, you've got your lizard brain. This is where your instincts and impulses come from. These are the automatic responses you have as a biological organism. You gravitate towards that which will satisfy your organic needs and away from things that cause pain and discomfort. Okay, that's, we're, we're animals. Um, you know, we are part animal. Can't deny that. Okay, that's our lizard brain. Now, built on top of that, humans have what we call the rat brain or the limbic brain. This is where your emotions come into play. Crocodiles don't have a lot of emotions, neither do snakes, okay? But rats, uh, dogs, cats, primates, we've got emotion. And so that adds additional charge to our animal selves, all right? Uh, people, if somebody tries to steal something from us, we don't just pull away and ignore them. We get angry, okay? We often want revenge. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we're different than, than lizards. And so with our limbic brain, it adds emotion to our animal urges. Now, on top of that, Humans have this huge, whole, this gigantic prefrontal cortex, and that gives us our rational brain. The rational brain allows us to think of our futures. The rational brain allows us to think of the futures of our family members and loved ones. And so we're able to do battle with our animal brain so that when my rat brain and my lizard brain are saying, oh, I got to go to the bathroom so bad, I'm going to do it right here in the hall, the rational brain says, no, there will be consequences if I drop my pants and do something right here in the hall. You know, I got a future to think about. And so don't do that. That's your rational brain keeping your animal brain in check. All right, so it's not that the animal brain is useless and always bad. It's just the rational brain is needed so that you have a future, so that your family has a future, the future for whatever, the future for academics, the future for a job, the future for love relationships, the future that you, you want to have a good relationship with your children and, and friends and so forth. So the rational brain. We use that to look out for ourselves and to modify our impulses and behaviors. Now, humans, in addition to all these biological components to self, we've got a spirit, all right? And I think I, I talk about that to death. If you look at my near-death stuff, you know, the evidence that we have a spirit is off the charts today, and I, I really believe any logical, truly rational individual will have to agree that yes, when you die, there is a self, there is the thing that's really you that will depart from your body and come out, and it's you. It's you, able to feel and think and see and everything, all right? That, that, that's you, and it comes out. And that's another part that does, that takes, a, a, plays a role in your rational brain, okay? But there's, there's, your, there's your fourth consciousness. Now, for a human, we could give in to our lower impulses and just live for food, sex, drugs, greed, you know, pleasure. We could do that and just satisfy our lower brains or we can use our rational brains so that these behaviors are modified to more acceptable practices, practices that are consistent with a happy family, with happy friends, and with a relationship with God and uh, better relationships with other people in general. So if we make the choice to give in to our lower nature and gratify them at whatever expense and break the rules, that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. And in the biblical world, that kind of thing will get you judged. If you put gratifying your urges ahead of more rational spiritual future things, 
you're going to get in some trouble. And you will not be admitted admission into the Intergalactic Council of Superior Beings. Only on the God side, obviously. I'm being facetious. So I like that particular scene because there are people that will say, my urges are the only thing that make life worth living. The question is this. When you die, when you come out of your body, are those urges going to play any role whatsoever in your existence. I haven't heard anybody's near-death experience that would suggest that they are. I haven't heard any, any, any from, not on, not on YouTube, not among my own patients, okay, and certainly not in the Bible. So you're looking at urges that are only relevant, relevant for life on earth here, that lack relevancy hereafter. Therefore, does it make sense to put all your eggs in the basket of hormonal gratification on earth. Not just hormonal, but we call those vegetative needs. That includes hunger, sex, whatever. Those vegetative needs are specifically an earth thing. So to spend our lives worshiping our animal self and gratifying our animal self at the expense of rational and spiritual needs, that is a dumb thing. And from a biblical perspective, that is the kind of thing that gets us rejected. Okay, in this last one, in this last video, this was, I think, maybe the most profound point of all that is made. And I'm, I'm very happy for this clip because it really drives a point home. And I kind of alluded to it earlier. When people hear about the spiritual deal that God is offering in the Bible, uh, take some steps towards faith in me, trust that Christ died on the cross for your sins, and make an effort to follow him, read what he had to say, and obey what Jesus said and continue doing that, and in response to that kind of faith, you'll be brought into God's family as one of his children. You'll I mean, literally brought into God's royal family so that you are considered not peons in heaven, but God's actual children. I mean, that, 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 that it's way above what you can comprehend. It really is. Just reading about that, I'm thinking, that doesn't, that's just, doesn't make any sense. I'm happy for the deal, but when you're talking about an entity as powerful and intelligent as the God of the universe, inviting us to be family members doesn't seem rational, okay? But there it is, okay? Jesus rose from the dead, kind of validates that he was who he claimed to be. That's the deal we're made, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, cool, I'll take it, right? But then on the other hand, what if you don't? You got this horrific future. I mean, hell, that's that sounds bad, okay? I mean, I've listened to some hell experiences, and I read what the Bible has to say about hell, and no matter how you cut it, it sounds horrible, and it doesn't end. And people get upset about that and go, man, you know, because there is such a downside here that is so horrible, it would be more humane if God would just force us to be good, just force us to do the right thing, force us to love each other, force us to love him. And if he did that, it would be a much better universe because nobody would go to hell. Everybody would be happy and it, the, the universe would be full of peace and happiness and joy and that's what a truly good God would do. He would not allow anybody to go to that bad place. Well, this next clip illustrates why that probably wouldn't work the way you think it would. Hi. Hey, sorry about the other night. It was... <laughs> Can I cook you supper? Uh, no, thanks, Neil. I'm doing a whole suckling pig. No. Hey, what's the matter? Is it because I'm, I made you throw yourself at Grant? No. Look, you did what you had to do. It worked. Forgotten. Well, what is it then? Do you know what it feels like to be in someone else's power? To have no will of your own? Look, I, I thought that I made you love me. What? You know, with my powers. Oh, my God. Did I really come home early tonight because I wanted to, or did you make me? Oh, have I always lived opposite you, or have you somehow rearranged things? I'm never going to know. Look, I love you. How can any woman love a man who can make her do whatever he wants, any second, every day, forever? No, I'm sorry, Nick, I could never love you. Not in a million years. No. Oh. Catherine. OK, 
Okay, some really great dialogue here. I, I love the part where Catherine goes, do you know what it feels like to be in someone else's power, to have no will of your own? I could never love somebody with that kind of control over me. Now I want you to think about that. Imagine a couple thousand years from now we're all sitting around and suddenly it comes out. Do you know what? You're in heaven and you love God because he forces you to. You have no choice. You never had a choice. You never had a choice regarding how you treat people. You never had a choice regarding whether or not to pursue a relationship with God or to like him or do anything he wants. You just automatically do this stuff because you had no choice. How do you think we'd feel about it if we had the free will to choose how we responded to that? Okay. Now, of course, if we have no free will, we'd say, that's okay, I love God, so I'm happy he does it that way because I love the Lord. But if he didn't force us the whole time and he just influenced our decision to enter into a relationship with him and then he gave us free will, with our newly found free will, many people would probably rebel the way Catherine has here. It's like, no, I don't want to be in a love relationship with somebody that forces me to love them. God has not given us absolute power to do absolutely anything. He's given us limited free will, and with that limited free will, we can choose whether to pursue a relationship with God or not. That makes our choices real. Only if we have free will can love be real. Okay? Think about it. I want you to just think about that. Is there any other way that love can be genuine unless the participants have the free will? You have to be able to choose to love or to choose to walk away from that love. Only then is love real. Not only love, all virtuous behavior. It's not virtuous if it's an instinct and you have no choice. Really, that's the way it works. I mean, do you, do you, do you feel like you, you deserve an award for eating an egg when you're hungry? Of course not. You don't have it. I mean, you can eat something else, obviously, but you have to eat or stay alive. I mean, you have urges, and the, you, don't have a, you, don't, you don't have a choice in the matter. With regard to morality, it's called morality because you have a choice. Do you do the good thing? Do you do the bad thing? Do you do the right thing? Do you do the easy thing? It's a real choice. And having a relationship with God is a thing that God is not going to force us to do. He doesn't want robots. He wants the choice to be real. So in the end, you can never come back and be resentful that God made you do anything. He didn't make you love him. If you choose a relationship with him, you started down that path and you chose it. You played a role in it. So it's not forced. And therefore, Whatever thing you do that is noble and good, whatever you do out of love for others or out of love for God, it's because your free will, you made a choice. And that's what makes it all very real. I'm, I'm repeating myself over and over again. But again, I thought these clips were great. Um, I'm glad that they did this in the movie. Uh, the clips are better than the movie overall. <laughs> so I just wanted to point that out. I, I've been meaning to do this for some time and procrastinating. I just want to get this out there. And uh, if somebody needs to, if it helps somebody, awesome, uh, great. Uh now, for people who've been struggling with these issues and angry at God because somebody died or somebody got sick or somebody did something bad and they wonder, you know, why doesn't God use his power to make things right? Keep these clips in mind and ask yourself, do you really want a universe where there's somebody walking around with absolute power, one of your neighbors or even you at a younger age? Uh, if you think that you could control absolute power, uh, you don't know yourself very well. And if you want your neighbors to have absolute power, uh, then, then you have other problems, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, so hopefully this clears some things up for you. Thank you for watching.